Hello and welcome to an episode of The Central Equilibrium. I'm Eric Kai, the chemical statistician, and I'm pleased to welcome my guest, Lane Newhouse, who will talk about how to represent neural networks in the first of a multi-episode series on neural networks. Lane, welcome to The Central Equilibrium. Thanks, Eric, for having me. So tell us about your educational background. So I graduated in 2014 at Queen's University in the Electrical and the Computer Engineering Department. Uh -huh. And currently I got accepted for a master's program at the University of Toronto in the Mechanical and Industrial Engineering Department. Excellent. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And what are you going to focus on in that master's program? I'm going to be looking at courses under the umbrella of operations research and uh -huh. information engineering. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, uh, what is your current occupation? Currently, I'm working as a research associate here at Environics Analytics, mm -hmm. and I work in the research and development department. Okay, cool. So, uh, what's your objective for today overall? Today, I would like to go over the basic structure of neural networks, mm -hmm. kind of defining what a neural network is, giving a diagram of a neural network, and then defining some of the basic mathematics behind the neural networks. Excellent. Okay. So let's get started. Uh, cool. let, let, I'll, I'll start erasing the board uh, so that we have some more room to write. And why don't we start off with the question of what is a neural network? Okay. So the neural network is a computing system or a supervised learning algorithm that has been inspired by the neural networks in a human or animal's brain. Loosely inspired, I should say. Okay. Um, it increases the performance as you feed it more training examples, okay. and these training examples have to be labeled training examples, and that's what gives it the name supervised learning. Okay, yeah. and we're going to talk about what it means to be labeled as we give an example of how a neural network works. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, why is a neural network so powerful and popular? Right now, I think the main reason neural networks are popular is because the algorithms themselves have been around for a few decades, mm -hmm. but it's not until recently that we've really had the computational power, the vast amount of input data, label training data for these systems, mm -hmm. and we have also had some breakthroughs in the algorithms. Mm -hmm. With all this put together, there are more people researching this now, and there are theses left, right, and center coming from different universities of people trying to make that, that next push, make that next benchmark in terms mm -hmm. of... Um, image recognition, speech recognition, and a plethora of other kind of applications to deep learning and neural networks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, just to remind everybody, this is a multi-episode series on neural networks. Today, we're just gonna focus on representing neural networks, and Lane and I are gonna go over some of the more exciting topics uh, as we move forward in this series. So. Uh, Lay, let's now talk about, you mentioned earlier that neural networks are inspired from biology. So what is the motivation through biology for neural networks? So people have always been, always been trying to replicate intelligence or the human brain. Mm -hmm. And so the idea with the neural network is that you have a single neuron mm -hmm. and that neuron passes information to other neurons in the brain. Mm -hmm. There are no feature engineering. There's no... All it is is raw inputs that we see from our eyes or hear from our ears, mm -hmm. and then it goes and passes from one neuron to the next. Mm -hmm. And so the idea in a artificial neural network is that we use the neuron as the fundamental building block, mm -hmm. and all of the sum of the inputs of that neuron will kind of determine whether that neuron sends an output to the next neurons that precede it. Mm -hmm. And that's... Mm -hmm. That's the basic idea is these neurons are firing to other neurons based on if they have enough signal coming from them mm -hmm. to activate that next signal going forward. Right. And so those of us who have studied a bit about biology, especially the biology of nervous systems, I, I think we can uh, all remember the, the basic tenet of how neurons work is that it, it's the all or nothing principle. The, uh, a neuron has to gather enough of the electrical impulse in order to decide whether or not it's going to fire the the, the signal onto the next neuron, uh, so I think that's that's generally what what Lane was getting at in, yeah. in um, that last point. So, okay, so let, let's move on from the biology and let's now start talking about neural networks in terms of in in the context of statistics and machine learning. So, how do you represent a neural network? And let, let's start with the diagram. Okay. Sounds good. So I'm going to put the diagram on this side of the board at first, and then I have room for equations later. Here, 
let's say we have an example of three different features uh -huh. um, in our variable set. So we have x1, x2, mm -hmm. and x3. Now we are going to have our first hidden layer of nodes that we'll explain a little bit more later, and those will be four nodes looking like a layer one, node one, mm -hmm. a layer one, node two, a layer uh, one, node three, and a layer one, node four. So I say layer one because it's in this vertical line, mm -hmm. and I'll put circles around them because they represent the neurons or nodes. Those are analogous terms Okay. here. Um, for each neuron that we have, mm -hmm. we are going to pass in every single input. So X1 is going to be connected to every single individual neuron. X2 is going to be connected to every single neuron. And X3, again, connected to all the neurons. So these lines start to overlap and look a little funny, but I think that you understand mm -hmm. the idea here. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to have one output layer. So let's write hidden layer. Mm -hmm. And this is the input layer. This is the input there. layer, yes. And here we'll have an output layer. Hopefully we can still see Yes, that yes screen. we can. Yeah. And this, in this example, we'll do a layer two, and just one node for the the output layer. Each of the preceding um, layers are going to have an output, just like we said with the signal coming out, if it's high enough. And each of these will connect to this neuron in the next layer. So it will have four inputs, and then this will produce our y hat prediction mm -hmm. okay good so i think it's important to remember that in a neural network every predictor connects to every neuron in this hidden layer here yes so there are a total of 12 connections between the 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 three predictors and the four uh nodes in the hidden layer uh, and now, now Lane, I have a question for you here. So, yeah. in in regression in statistics, we often have an intercept term. Um, in so in, in linear regression, we have uh, y hat is equal to beta zero uh, plus beta one x one plus beta two x two and so on. Yeah. So, is there an intercept term in in a neural network? There absolutely is an intercept uh -huh. term. We will see it when we go into the actual mathematical okay. uh, function of this. Okay. There are different uh, diagram representations of a neural network. I have seen some with the intercept term. Uh -huh. The one that I'm following is specifically from Coursera Andrew Ng's courses. Okay. And in okay. his courses, he doesn't write the intercept term because okay. a little backing on one of the reasons is instead of having a separate B term, uh -huh. when you actually start coding this up, what you can do is you can have a x0 uh -huh. um, sitting at the top, uh -huh. and this x0 is set to 1, uh -huh. and that, the weight on that x0 acts as your intercept term. So there's no need to write right. another thing there. Right. It's just, um, I suppose it's implied in this architecture, but yep. absolutely you need the bias term in the neural network. Understood. Okay. Yeah. So that's the um, representation of a, di of a neural network in a diagram. Uh, shall we now talk about how to represent a neural net network in, in terms of formulas, in terms of the math? Absolutely. Okay. So I will note here as I go through this math that every single neuron acts pretty much the exact same way. So when uh -huh. we explain mathematically one of the neurons, we uh -huh. can apply that or extrapolate that to the rest of the neurons and how to solve the problem. Okay. So for every, every A that we have, A is going to be calculated by the activation or sigma of z. And now we don't have to find z yet, so we'll go ahead and do that. z equals the weights times by our x vector. 
So we'll weight factor times the x factor plus the bias term or the intercept that you were talking about. Right, okay. So right now I don't have a subscript on x because this x is a vector that represents each one of these x's. So okay. this will be three x's and okay. the weights there is a weight term that is applied to every single individual x. So when you said over here mm -hmm. there are 12 connections, mm -hmm. there are actually 12 separate weight variables mm -hmm. that will each be applied to each individual x mm -hmm. at each individual node. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we break this out, or let's say we want to calculate what is the output of this top node, mm -hmm. a1. Mm -hmm. So we're first going to need to, to calculate a, mm -hmm. we'll need to calculate z. Mm -hmm. Z, um, node one, layer one, is going to be equal to our weight at node one, layer one, times our x, plus our bias at node one, layer one. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a scalar term. These are still in vector representation, so I will go ahead and break those out. Mm -hmm. It's going to be weights node 1, layer 1, applied to input 1. Mm -hmm. times, mm -hmm. This will be multiplied by x1 mm -hmm. plus weights 1. Do you think you're right? Do you want to write write this on the on the next line? Yeah. yeah, I think you might run out of room there. You're right. Let's yeah. do that. Okay. Plus weights one applied to the second input in layer one multiplied by x two mm -hmm. plus weights one the the final. So if you imagine if we had image recognition and you have thousands of pixels, you will have thousands and thousands of weight terms, mm -hmm. but that's how we start actually learning and coming mm -hmm. up with these complex representations of mm -hmm. the input mm -hmm. data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Plus bias, one, layer mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's important to point out to everybody here that all of this just concerns how to represent this one node right here, right? We would have to repeat this process with different with different weights, of course, and, and a different uh, intercept term for each of these other hidden neurons, right? These hidden nodes. So this equation is, is going to get a lot bigger. Uh, so, so remember, this right here is a vector, right? And, uh, and, and, and so this is just one element of that vector. And just apply to three single inputs where you right. have thousands and thousands of inputs right. in a picture or an audio file right. or whatnot. Okay. And now to complete this final thing, we have a, a layer one, node one, is going to equal our sigmoid function, which we will get into very shortly, uh -huh. times the z1 that we've calculated, layer one. So this, again, is just the output coming down right here mm -hmm. at the very top that's one calculation mm -hmm. the exact same calculation will happen here with different weights will happen here and will happen again here mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. those four will now act as the inputs just as these x's did they will take the place of these x's in this formula and act as the input which gets mm -hmm. multiplied by another weight um, vector yeah and allowed to compute um, yeah. our value coming out of A2, mm -hmm. layer 2, node mm -hmm. 1, mm -hmm. which will end up being our mm -hmm. prediction y. Right. So I, I think it would be a good exercise for everybody who is watching this, this episode here to, to write the, the, the representation for the three other nodes in this hidden layer. So Lane's done the hard work for us for, for this first node. Everybody else at home, write the rest of this for all f uh, the, the other three notes, just so that you have the, the, the somewhat tedious but very important exercise of writing out all of these subscripts and superscripts, because it, it, it can get a, a kind of complicated just keeping track of all of these subscripts and superscripts, but that's how you learn 
how to represent a neural network mathematically. Yeah. And when you do that, you'll really understand what it is that makes up this neural network and you can start programming it because you understand yeah. how big these matrices are and vectors need to be and how yeah. to organize them properly. Yeah, okay. So one of the things that I also kind of wanted to touch on here was that this activation function we haven't touched on. Mm -hmm. And the activation function will be applied, can be applied separately to each of the nodes and the output. And specifically, we can have activations that allow us to have predictions that are binary, so 0 or 1, mm -hmm. or give us a probability between 0 and 1. Mm -hmm. And we can also have activation functions that allow us to have a scalar output, so some kind of regression or prediction. Maybe mm -hmm. it's a housing prices or mm -hmm. stock prediction or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so if you're ready, we can start looking at a couple of these activations. Yeah, functions. yeah, yeah. So, so which, which part should I, should we ex I think erase? I'll erase the mathematical notation math? and we okay. can still look at this okay. and have this as a reference. Okay. So, our, the original activation functions were all sigmoid functions because okay. going back to that um, biological, like you said, it's either an all or nothing. It's a one or a zero. Right. And so they wanted to kind of illustrate that using a sigmoid function. Okay. And the, a sigmoid function is based on the fact that there's an S shape yeah. in the function. So our first one is the logistic function. Uh -huh. So I'll write this down. Very good when using a binary classification. Very good. Mm -hmm. Even using even using your hidden layers to just send that one or zero to the mm -hmm. next node. Mm -hmm. So the logistic function is by formula one over one plus e to the negative z. And this is going to be our s of z. And graphically this looks like here, S of Z. This is bounded, and this will be Z, by 1 is the upper bound, 0 0.5 is the y-intercept, and 0 is the lower bound. So I'll draw our nice S shape that goes through Y at 0 0.5, and asymptotes at 0 and 1. So mm -hmm. One more thing to write here is zero is less than S of Z, mm -hmm. it's less than one, mm -hmm. and where Z is less than negative infinity, and is greater than negative infinity, and less than positive infinity. Mm -hmm. And if I, if I may, uh, absolutely, I just, I just want to make sure here, we're going to make sure that write that little mark on the z just to ah uh, yes okay. make sure it's not two yeah and then and then uh i'm just gonna push this mark for the minus one yeah a little bit higher just to accentuate the point that this is an asymptote yes. right so this yes. is so this is one okay that's a good point that looks good okay so uh, I hope that everybody can understand why the, the logistic function crosses the y-axis at 0 0.5 because at z is equal to 0, e to the minus 0 is equal to 1. Yeah. So then the, the, the denominator becomes 2 and 1 over 2 is equal to 0 0.5. So that's why this y-intercept here is 0 0.5. Okay, so that's... That's our, uh, that, that's our uh, uh, logistic function as an activation function. Uh, and, and so we have a few other activation functions to, to review? Yep, okay. and before we hit the other activation functions, I wanna say that this logistic function is very, very popular, especially when we're doing classification. So let's say we have a cat classifier and we have a whole bunch of examples of the pixels that are coming in as our inputs, mm -hmm. and we wanna know whether it's a cat or it's not a cat. Mm -hmm. And so our output, based on all of the pixels, and mm -hmm. after going through the hidden layers and being transformed mm -hmm. and having that complex representation, mm -hmm. will come out the y hat as maybe something like 0 
0.98, meaning mm. that it's 98% chance that this is a picture of a right. cat. Right. And so that's how you use that. If you wanted to have multiple categories of outputs, let's say you are trying to predict the model of a car or mm. the make of a car, mm -hmm. and you had 10 choices. Mm. You could have 10 different outputs that mm. each have a zero or one. Mm. And after going through, it would say this is an 80% probability it's an mm. Acura, mm. a 10% probability that it's a Dodge mm -hmm. pickup, mm -hmm. etc. So you can start playing with this and creating the architecture of this model based mm. on your inputs and mm. how you want it to predict the output. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to point out for for a multi-category classifier where there are uh, many categories, two or more, yeah. the probabilities for all of those categories must sum to one. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and, and by default, most binary classifiers classify something as one if it's greater than, if the probability is greater than 0 0.5. And and uh, as zero, if the probability is less than zero point five, mm -hmm. but that's the default classification rule. You can create whatever rule you want, yeah. right? Um, so so the 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 hard part for the neural network is is predicting the probability yeah. of 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 success. Okay, I I I feel badly about who I put this mark, and this pro probably should have been a little bit lower than that. Okay, that's okay. Pro probably somewhere there. Okay. Uh, and we'll rewrite this uh, with the next sigmoid function coming up. Okay. So so that's the logistic function with, with asymptotes at, at 0 and 1 and crossing the y-intercept at 0 0.5. Okay. So the next activation function, Lane. Yep. The next activation function we have is the hyperbolic tangent function. Okay. So... So this one is f of z equals tan h of z, which equals e to the z minus e to the negative z divided by e to the z plus e to the negative z. And this looks like Very similar to the other one, but our bounds are now at negative one and positive one. Make sure that shows as a one, with the intercept being at zero here. And we'll draw the graph. A nice. Okay. Hopefully that. Yeah, yeah, that's good. No, that's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah. And quickly here f of z is bounded by um, 1 and 0, sorry, negative 1. Yeah. And z is again bounded by positive infinity and negative infinity. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you don't mind, then just put the marks on the z here and the z yes. there. Yes. Yeah. Inconsistent, that's a strange. Yeah. 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 Great. Okay, so the hyperbolic tangent function, it looks very similar to the logistic function, except that the, the lower bound is at negative one rather than zero. Yeah. Okay, uh, and it crosses the y-axis at z is equal to zero. So with this function... Yeah. Sorry, it crosses the y-axis at, at, at zero. So at zero, at, yes. Yeah. Let me uh, actually put the... At z f of z is equal to zero. F of z. Yeah, it crosses the y-axis at f of z is equal to zero. Sorry about that. Okay, sorry. So we won't spend really too much time on this because this is very much like the mm -hmm. um, our first function, which was the logistic function. Mm -hmm. It can be used interchangeably with the logistic function. And to be honest, from all the stuff that I've heard and from the lessons that I've learned, a lot of figuring out what the right activation function is, looking at what some people did in papers, and also a little bit of trial and error. There's not a lot okay. of 
scientific evidence on when you should use it, it kind of changes from data set to data set. And the more you deal with neural networks, the more you might be able to pinpoint why you might mm -hmm. want to use a tangent function or a logistic function. Okay. Next up, we'll have a rectified linear unit. Now, this is an output that is regression-like. Okay. And you can definitely understand why you'd want a value that predicts something between 1 or 0 and positive infinity for any kind of prediction of numbers, stock prices, or housing okay. prices. So for continuous output variables. Yes, thank right. you. Right. So this function is the rectified linear unit or really the, the function here is f of z equals the maximum of 0 comma z and let's draw this Z, I put my glasses, F of Z, and this follows, it's always zero until it goes past zero, and then it goes up at a 45 degree angle and is just equal to Z mm -hmm. after that point. Okay. So, F of Z itself is bounded by um, it's greater or equal to zero, and then it's less than positive infinity, mm -hmm. as z is greater than negative infinity and less than positive infinity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this function uh, looks like um, the identity function y uh, f of z is equal to z, except that because uh, the the minimum has to be has to be has to be zero um, when when z is negative f of z is zero it can't it can't be any negative value yeah. okay all right so uh, so Lane you mentioned that this this activation function is used for predicting continuous variables yeah. continuous responses especially when on our output layer. Mm -hmm. um, it will predict any continuous response because it's going to give you anything ranging from zero to positive infinity. Now, it mm -hmm. won't predict negative numbers. Uh -huh. I actually haven't seen any instance of why you would maybe want to predict negative numbers, but um, maybe it's a matter of scaling your output afterwards. But this is, as it stands, just um, zero to positive infinity. I actually mm -hmm. suppose that on your output layer, if you needed negative numbers, you could not have a activation function. You could just say that z equals z. Mm -hmm. But it's typically, and especially in the hidden layers, you need this activate activation function. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that having this maximum zero comma z allows you to do is mm -hmm. make the nonlinear representation. So the nodes have the ability to turn on at any value, but mm -hmm. also turn off. And that's especially um, important when you're doing certain types of or, or exclusive or functions that you couldn't replicate using just a linear operation. Hmm. Can you expand on that a little more? Because I, I don't think I fully understand what you mean by that. If we want in the next one, I can definitely go over um, an example of using XOR. I think XOR, which is the exclusive or. Okay. Can, is shown to only be able to work in a nonlinear sense. You okay. can't actually do it using a linear combination of things, and I can definitely do an example of that okay. next time. Okay, so, yeah. so stay tuned for the next episode in this multi-episode series on neural networks. Okay, um, so uh, I, think, I think this is a good introduction to how to represent neural networks in, in a diagram, and also mathematically, we talked about how uh, in, in a neural network, there's an input layer that maps to a hidden layer. Every predictor in the input layer has to connect to every node in the out, uh, in the hidden layer. And then um, uh, in this in this in this single layer, 
um, a neural network with, and so a neural, ne neural network with, with one hidden layer, uh, these are then connected to an, an activation function that is used to predict the, the response variable. Um, and, and then we talked about the, um, the representation mathematically. Uh, and, and again, we encourage everybody to, to go back to, to um, that equation, write out uh, the, the full representation with the subscripts and the superscripts. Uh, and, and also, uh, Lane concluded by talking about the, the three common activation functions, the logistic function, the hyperbolic tangent function, and the rectified linear unit. Um, so uh, this this is a, a very nice start to uh, uh, this this series on neural networks. So so thank you so much, Lane. Um, Absolutely, no and, problem. And um, so uh, just just the last few questions. Um, is there a, a a book or a website or a, a podcast? Anything that you've been been using to learn more about math or science recently? So, in terms of in the neural network area, yeah. some of the things that I really enjoy doing are taking courses on Udacity and Coursera. Okay. Coursera especially has an instructor named Andrew Ng. He yeah. teaches a deep learning dot AI specialization, and he goes through the whole thing from beginning to end, and you start learning about things that we haven't talked about: convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, okay. image detection, speech detection. So. If you want to get your hands dirty and actually get coding in some of these, okay, absolutely recommend some of that stuff. Excellent. Okay, and I'll I'll put I'll put that information in the show notes, the description to this YouTube video. Great, excellent. That was uh, that was wonderful, Lane. I really appreciate your time to, to do this, and uh, I look forward to that that next episode that we're gonna do uh, in this good. series. Um, so uh, my guest has been Lane Newhouse uh, in this first episode of a series on neural networks. Today, he talked about representing neural networks. Um, I'm Eric Kai, the chemical statistician. If you'd like to learn more about math, statistics, chemistry, machine learning, uh, or if you'd like some advice on your career development, please visit my blog, The Chemical Statistician. Uh, you can also find my YouTube videos on, on my YouTube channel. And you can find me on Twitter at ChemStatEric. And you can find all of that information in the description of this video down below uh, uh, in the show notes. Thank you so much for watching this video. And I hope that you learned something useful today. Thank you.